Let's get into tips you need to know to be able to find the domain of a function algebraically. So if you just finished a lecture and your homework is maybe due tonight, these tips are going to help you be able to get that homework done, not only now, but also give you a better understanding of how to find the domain. Let's get started with tip number one. You have to know the difference between included and excluded. You mean like normal included, excluded? Yeah, but I'm talking about points. We can identify when a value is within the domain is because its x value actually creates a point on the graph. So you can see here in the graph that I have here that all the x values that are negative are a part of our domain. It's going to be from negative infinity to zero. And you can see there is a physical point at zero. So we know the value zero is in the domain. Now, when we're talking about something algebraically, like f of x equals square root to negative 2x, which is the equation for this function, sometimes we don't know what the graph exactly is going to look like to identify the domain. So in this case, what we can do is just evaluate the function by plugging in values we want to know if they're in the domain or not. So you can see here when I plug in zero, I get zero. And because I received an output value for my input of zero, I know that the input value of zero is in the domain. Now it's very important to make sure we will want to show that a point is included on the domain, that for inequalities, we're gonna use a line, and for interval notation, we're gonna use brackets. Now let's talk about excluded. Obviously, if a point is not on the graph, it's not included in the domain. So we can say it's excluded within the domain. Now there's a couple different ways that we see excluded values. One, the graph isn't even featured, like in this function g of x, you can see there are no negative values. In addition to that, you can see we have a vertical asymptote, which is going to be excluded from the domain. Also, we might have a hole in the graph. That would be another example of an excluded value of the domain. Algebraically, the reason why the domain is not defined at zero is because when we try to evaluate the function g of x at zero, like we did for our previous function f of x, we get an undefined value. And to make sure we don't write zero being defined in our domain, we're gonna not include the lines this time time, and we're going to use parentheses as we write the domain. So it's important as we wrap up this first tip is remember included points in the domain are actually values of the graph. You can plug them into the equations and we use the greater than or less than or equal to sign and brackets. Excluded values are not on the graph. You cannot plug them into the function and we're going to use parentheses and the less than and greater than sign. Number two, know your graphs. Aw oh, crap, I hate graphing. Graphing is not all bad. The easy the easiest way to graph a function is knowing your parent functions. And if you know your parent functions and your transformations, you can graph most functions with ease. Now, when we're referring to the domain, it gets even better. The only basic functions that have a domain restrictions are going to be the square root function, the reciprocal function, the logarithmic function, and the tangent function. So you can see these four basic functions all have a restriction on their domain. That can be like from asymptotes, like one over x, ln of x, and tangent of x, or the function can just be restricted to only positive numbers like the square root of x. So if you know what these graphs look like and you know what their domains are, the transformations is just going to move that domain left and right. So for instance, the square root function is all positive numbers. The domain of the square root function is zero to infinity. But if I shift it one unit to the right, it would be one to infinity. In the same context, one over x has a domain of all real numbers except for zero. But if I shift everything one unit to the right, it's gonna be all real numbers except for one. So knowing these four functions and knowing the transformations is gonna save you a ton of time and understanding when you're trying to find the domain. Because our other functions all have a domain of all real numbers. Meaning it doesn't matter if you shift them left, right, up, or down, the domain is always gonna be all real numbers. And that's going to include constant function, the identity function, the quadratic function, the cubic function, the cube root function, the absolute value function, the exponential function, the sine function, and the cosine function. And as I mentioned, guys, these graphs all have a domain of all real numbers. So when you have a graph that has a domain of all real numbers, you can move it all the way you want to. So make sure you know those functions and their graphs because it is going to save you a ton of time finding the domains. You gotta know the graphs and it's gonna help you know how to graph the functions with transformations, which is very, very helpful rather than having to struggle with graphing each one of these functions. Number three, know your rules. Rules, rules. What I mean by know your rules, know your rules of the domain restrictions. We talked about those four functions there. Why are their domains restricted? Well, their domains are restricted because one, you cannot divide by zero. Two, you cannot take the square root of a negative number. And three, you cannot take the logarithm of a negative number. If you can write down those restrictions and make sure that you know them, they are going to come up time and time and time again. But guess what? There's more because those restrictions are fairly basic. We also want to make sure we understand what do different operations between functions do to impact our domain. 
So for example, if I have the function f of x equals square root of x and the function g of x equals x minus four, following those domain restrictions, you can't take the square root of a negative number, then the domain for f of x is gonna be zero to infinity. Since g of x does not have any restrictions, that domain is all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. So when I add the two functions, I do not add or change any of the restrictions. When you subtract two functions, you do not add or change any restrictions. And when you multiply, you do not add or subtract any restrictions. So therefore, the addition, subtraction, and multiplication of these two functions is going to be the same as the intersection of my original two domains, f of x and g of x, which is zero to infinity. So division actually adds a new constraint because whatever's in the denominator cannot equal to zero. So let's take our two functions, f of x and g of x again. Now, if I take f divided by g of x, I'm going to obtain now a square root of x divided by x minus four. So previously, my function g of x was defined for all real numbers, but once I put it into the denominator, now x cannot equal four. So therefore, my domain is going to be all positive values from zero to infinity, not including four. When I take the g of x function and divide it by f of x, I have the same restriction, but now my function cannot equal zero. Even though zero is defined for the square root of zero, once it goes into the denominator, it now becomes undefined. So my new domain is going to be from zero to infinity. Lastly, composition adds a restriction of the input function as well as the composition of your two functions. So again, staying with f of x and g of x, if I plug g of x into f of x, you can see that again, I'm taking a function g of x that is not restricted, but once I plug it into the f of x, I now create a restriction for all values that have to be greater than or equal to four. Because again, if it's less than four, the composition is going to be undefined. So I created this new restriction by plugging one function into the other. Now, when we plug f of x and plug it into g of x, we don't get the same effect. We had a domain restriction on our function, which is the input value that always remains the same. But when we plug it into our second function, we didn't add a new restriction. So when we're finding the domain of the composition of functions, you want to make sure you always look at the domain of the function you're plugging into, as well as the domain of the final composed function. So just a recap, I know sometimes those rules can get confusing, but it's really, really important to make sure that you get them down. You cannot divide by zero. You cannot take the square root of a negative number. You cannot take the logarithm of a negative number. Anytime you add, subtract, or multiply different functions, your domain is not going to change. When you divide functions, whatever you put in the denominator now has that new restriction of the denominator cannot equal zero. And when you compose functions, you always want to take the domain restriction of the function you are plugging into as well as the final composed function. Number four, when you're finding the domain of a function that has multiple restrictions, graph each restriction separately using a number line and then combine them to find the final domain. You can see in these two examples, I have multiple restrictions. In the first example, I have restrictions of the square root as well as the denominator. And the second example, g of x, you can see I have a radical in the numerator as well as a radical in the denominator. So we have more than one restriction. I bet by now you're probably wishing we could go back to those parent functions. You can say that again. Whenever I have multiple domain restrictions, I'm going to set up each restriction separately and then go ahead and solve them and graph. So you can see x plus one has to be greater than or equal to zero. So therefore my final solution is x is greater than or equal to negative one. And you can see I have the graph represented there. And then in the denominator, I set x minus two equal to zero and I go and solve x equals two is not a part of my domain. So I'm gonna combine them finding the intersection where both domains are true is going to be the domain of this function. And you can see anything less than negative one, both functions are not defined. At two, only one of the functions is defined. That's why we use an open circle and any value greater than two, both functions are defined. That's why it's shaded. So now the domain of this function is going to be from negative one to two, union two to infinity. In the next example, I'm gonna do the exact same thing. Separate my restrictions, solve, as well as graph. Now, once I have each function graph separately, I'm going to combine them on the same graph and again, find the intersection. My domain is gonna be where both domains are defined, which in this example is gonna be from negative three halves to one half. Now, if you wanna see me do more examples on the domain, go ahead and check the playlist down below. Or if you need more help with domain of functions, then go ahead and check out the next video I have for you here. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Cheers.